So we have another WoW cast, and we're about to find out what is coming for the War Within. <coughs> Subscribe. Hey everyone, welcome to WowCast. Today we're gonna to talk about The War Within, which alpha starts soon. I have two special guests with me today. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Ian, game director on WoW. I'm Tina, associate art director on WoW. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Before we talk about alpha, what can you summarize about The War Within, Ian? Well, so The War Within, I mean, of course, it is the 10th expansion to well-known <laughs> video game World of Warcraft. But even, I think, more special yeah. to us, it's the beginning of the World Soul Saga. It's the beginning of <laughs> oh, yeah. probably the most ambitious story we've ever tried to tell in WoW. Uh, so as you know, all expansions do, it kicks off with a journey to a new place. But really, this is going to be beginning to set the stage and establish the stakes for a conflict that threatens not just you know, ourselves and, and our families and those we hold dear, but the very world that we call home, the very world beneath our feet that's been home to all of our adventures. All right. If we don't win this one, nothing else matters. The thing that bothers me about this, and, and I'm taking nothing away from this, I am super excited for War Within, but here's the, the issue with everything that Ian is saying now. Unless... The War Within uses its structure to its advantage, none of this matters. So what do I mean by that? In the past, right, every expansion was its own little thing. And an expansion was usually finished long before they actually even started the next expansion. So they needed to know exactly how they're going to stop this one. So that, you know, they, so every expansion sort of just loosely tied to the first one. Now they have the, added benefit of knowing exactly how the expansion is going to play out over the course of three different expansions. We need to lose in at least one of the three. It would probably be better if we lost quite a lot in the build-up to the final one. And the reason for that is, if you know that every single event, every single obstacle in the game is just an obstacle for a short amount of time until you win, because winning is guaranteed, it loses a lot of its weight. That's why a lot of the time, nowadays at least, when Blizzard announces something big coming, I've given up on the idea that these big things matter, because you know they don't. Right? So for example, when we're told, oh, you have to, Farak, Farak is going to destroy the dream. And it's kind of like, oh, yawn. We know Farak isn't going to destroy the dream. We know that Blizzard isn't going to let that happen. We're going to face Farak in a final raid, and then we're going to kill him, and we're going to save the world. While you can't have giant losses, because obviously that could just end in the end of the world, you do need stakes. And for stakes to exist, we need to lose sometimes. And I think now is pretty... Now is probably like the perfect time for stakes like that, because when you know how the story is going to end after the third expansion, you can really make use of the first two expansions to set up and build the stakes so that by the time we get to the final expansion, players have this in the back of their mind, dude, we could lose all of this. Like, it, we could lose. Everything Blizzard has done up until now, we could lose this. So I'm really hoping that Blizzard does make use of that. In fact, needs to follow the lose the battle, but not the war idea. Take the owl at the end of this X pack, but sets up the war. Nico Spider very much agree with that. So this character has been everywhere for the war within. Zelotath. She's purple. She's amazing. Can you tell us more about her? Yeah, Zalatath is, uh, you know, one of our key villains of the World Soul Saga. The expansion is, I mean, part of it is this journey, uh, delving deeper, find Zalatath and her allies. I don't like the fact that they immediately give that away. One of the key villains of the expansion. Why? Why? Why immediately? I think right now it's sort of becoming clear that a lot of players do not trust the Titans. And even more players are sort of starting to become very sympathetic to the Void. 
why are we pretending like that's not the case? Why do we keep going around this or down this path of, oh, the void is bad, Titan's good? And uh, the inspiration uh, for her design from an art side was really based on the uh, priest artifact weapon that she had been trapped in for so long. So if you look at her armor, like all the motifs of you know, her belt, her shoulders, really take inspiration from that uh, design. Uh, even the runes on her cheeks. Uh, the Saving Raven, nefarious entity? She's been around as part of the Void. And there are more than enough pieces of evidence within the game that suggest that the Void is not the enemy and that the Void being the enemy is propaganda. It's Titan propaganda. We have so many pieces of evidence within the game just in the uh, Dragonflight that suggests that we don't know half the story of what actually happened to the Void here. We can go back to Battle for Azeroth and we can re-watch all of my videos made about the information that we got in Battle for Azeroth about Nazoth and Nazoth not actually wanting to kill all of us. No, I, I completely reject the idea that she's just a villain. I, not at all. The Void have plans, and by that I don't mean the Void wants to be our friends, but straight up villain, just they want to be the bad guys. I don't buy that. There's there's more than enough evidence to show the contrary to that. Those are a homage to Nazoth, who freed her from the dagger. Uh, Naifu. Yeah, so if later on in War Within you find yourself, you know, wiping to a raid somewhere, just blame the Shadow Priests for not just putting the knife down, yeah, why walk they away from the talking dagger, and oh, we wouldn't be here. Oh my and yet... Um, are there any other familiar faces that we can recognize? Uh, yeah, some of the key uh, heroes of our story are uh, Illyria and Anduin. So these two, they've, I mean, they're, they're running a bit, right, from some of the wounds of their past, but in the end, they're going to find hope and redemption. So, you know, Illyria, we've seen her uh, new design that really reflects the duality of her character. And Anduin, uh, we saw him in our cinematic, and he just looks, you know, a little more haggard. He's, he's been through a lot lately. He grows beard. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They've really matched Anduin's in-game model to uh, the cinematic. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the name The War Within is one that has a couple of layers to it. Right? Obviously, we're literally yeah. delving beneath the surface of Azeroth and going to be battling within our world. But this is also a story that involves a lot of inner turmoil and inner conflict. And Anduin is probably the most torn of any of our, our cast of heroes, given what he went through in the Shadowlands. And his journey into the darkness as he seeks to rediscover his own light is a big part of the narrative arc. And with the War Within, there's new zones. Can we talk about what our new zones are going to be? The continent as a whole that begins on the surface and extends beneath the Earth right, is we're calling Khazalgar. This is an ancient home to the Earthen. It's actually just off the west coast of Pandaria, about between Pandaria and Kalimdor. You know, just a, you know, a couple hundred nautical miles away from a certain sword that's sticking oh. out of the southern end of Kalimdor. But yes, home to four zones um, with amazing varied settings. Yeah, sorry. I feel like there's a hint in there. I do feel like there's a hint in there. Hmm. Uh, we'll talk about that when we have a bit more information, but that's definitely a hint. First zone, uh, the Isle of Dorne. This is basically, you'll find an isolated group of Earthen there. And so they have their awesome city, Dornogal, which we're very excited to, for players to check out. That'll be the hub in the end. Uh, the second zone it's is the Wind city. Deeps. So, you know, the evocative of like mine picks, industry. And so this is the heart of Earthen industry. But it's not all just, you know, lava and fire. It's uh, mixed with these beautiful caverns, cenotes with uh, light and water coming in, creating these. Uh, you know, lush spaces for the okay, players to beautiful enjoy. Looking, beautiful then, looking expansions. Uh, we go to Halafall. Halafall is where we really uh, wanted to break expectations. I right, like this one. Uh, this is Arathi airships. Right, underground airships, right? It's the first thing you'd naturally <laughs> think of when you're going under the surface. How are they going to get around? Well, airships, of course. Of course. <laughs> And then our final zone is Ashkahet. So this is the heart of the Nerubian Empire. This is where we'll finally be able to see the Nerubians in all of their strength and glory, like with the height of their civilization. 
I think uh, we'll get into the details of Alpha later, but everyone's journey is going to start in the Isle of Dorne. But I really can't wait until we get to Hallowfall in our testing. And I think the you know Tina mentioned that this crystal, it is such a striking visual element that dominates the zone. Imagine in this place deep within the earth, a radiant crystal of light, and the way you know as it illuminates the surroundings, that actually plays with the environment and some of the spawns and how the world around it reacts to it. I think when we set out to create this underground space, just what if the crystal is not actually a crystal? Just, just a bit of interesting thought there. If you want to hide the true purpose and the true sense of what that thing is that sticks out of the the roof, then calling it a crystal is probably a good idea. Because that's what it kind of looks like, so why would you do anything else? We knew that one of the risks was that it could feel oppressive, that people didn't want to feel the sense of claustrophobia of you're always in caves. Mm -hmm. Hallowfall really from the outset was built to be a place where, honestly, unless you fly all the way up to check out the ceiling above you, it doesn't feel underground. It feels like you could be outdoors in some vast welcoming area that's just, it's incredibly epic. When we arrive you to the Isle of Dawn, what's the, the first thing we'll see? Well, so you're going to see something a bit different in Alpha from when the expansion goes live. There is an expansion intro experience that is not currently being tested. It's something that has some you know, cool narrative elements that we want players to all experience together later in the year when War Within launches. Nice. But players will spawn in in the Alpha on the Isle of Dorn, surrounded by some debris that will look pretty familiar and pretty distinctive, and really Whoa. is the scars of an initial battle that seems like it didn't end so well. Um, and the beginning of our journey, as, as, many, as with many expansions, is a bit of a mystery, a bit of an investigation of, of arriving in a strange land, having this threat that we face, these visions, these whispers, that heroes around as. Dalaran or maybe a twin? Something akin to it? Right? Because remember, the civilizations that originally built Dalaran, um, before, of course, it was lifted out of the ground and moved around and became the magical city. Um, the Arathians were very much part of that, right? They would have had a hand in it. So it is possible that they built more things like it. The other thing that that could be very easily is the spaceships from the Draenei, right? Um, sort of similar design, sort of similar, but this would immediately make, uh, create a lot of questions about how long have the Draenei actually been here? And perhaps some Draenei didn't make it all the way um, you know, to where the main Eridor or the, the, the main forces fell and some went through. It, it's weird. <clears throat> Get Alpha, will you play it? No, King Julian, I will not. Azeroth have been hearing in, in recent months, but trying to understand the nature of the threat we face, how we're going to stop it, and our journey begins on the doorstep of these ancient earthen people who are going to begin, you know, helping us figure out where to go next. They're going to become our next allied race too, right? Once we are in their trust, that's for <laughs> sure. Is there any other NPCs that we're going to be familiar with? Yeah, there are going to be cool. uh, some characters that we haven't seen in World of Warcraft in a while, but will be, you know, part of this story uh, as because of their, you know, dwarven heritage and, you know, Magni, he hears the Radiant Song. I, I, I can safely say if I never hear Magni speak again, it would be too soon. He brings some of his family members along. Uh, Moira, who is leader now, of the Dark Moira Iron Dwarves like and heir to Ironforge. Uh, she'll be here with her son, Dagran, who is now a young adult. Uh, Dagran, the last time we saw him in game, he was this pretty generic looking dwarven baby. But now, <laughs> uh, you know, the Dark Iron heritage is starting to show more in his appearance, along with his personality. So he has a bunch of these scrolls and books, like really showing that he has a very scholarly nature. I think one of the one of the fun aspects of just world building and narrative in WoW is we have this vast array of characters and champions and heroes and, and you know backup characters, 
And whenever we figure out where we're going, what the next natural location is, what the story elements are, the first question we ask is, who needs to be here? Who does it make sense to have answer this call, want to step forward? Just as when we were dealing with you know, the Green Dragon Flight or the Emerald Dream or, or the like, okay, this is time for Malfurion and Tyrande to step forward. Now that we're going to this ancestral homeland of the Earthen with this ancient connection to the Dwarven legacy of Azeroth, this is a time for our dwarves to take center stage. I feel like outside of Magni, obviously, I feel like this is this is like long overdue. And specifically because we have the Arathians in there as well. Now the Arathians date back to the earliest human kingdoms. So you're probably gonna get a lot of dwarven lore, but also probably a lot of human lore. You know, a lot of things that a lot of modern day humans may not even know because Lordaeron fell in its entirety. So those who were around during the, like the earliest, earliest years of Lordaeron are either Scourge, right? So have mostly forgotten most of that or no longer even really care or are just mindless. So really don't know anything there. So it's going to be interesting, but I do, I like the fact that the, the dwarves are getting a little bit more, um, lore and a little bit more love because they they're one of the more forgotten races uh on azeroth for the most part at least within like in terms of major storylines all right so let's talk about the eight new dungeons in the war within what are your guys's favorites or the notable ones you want to talk about well so one let's see one that's fun to talk about is actually probably the first dungeon the players are going to see in their journeys and it's going to be tested early on in the alpha this is the rookery dungeon in the isle of dorne the Rookery is the place where the Storm Griffins were raised and trained by the ancient Earthen over, over the centuries. Sure. Um, you know, right. Dwarves and Griffins go hand in hand, and the Earthen have a legacy of Storm Riders that you know, we got to see a little sneak cool peek looking. of. If you, you know, got the War Within Heroic Edition, you might have been flying around uh, on that guy. There's plenty more where that came from in the Isle of Dorne. And so and this dungeon, of course, is not all peaceful. Uh, it's been overrun by a group of corrupted Earthen known as the Skarden. And we're going to be just beginning to understand where they came from and what their nature is as we fight through it. I'm trying to remember here. The Earthen are still constructs that have not been turned if i'm if i'm not mistaken the earthen are what the dwarves came from or am i misunderstanding because you do have it is right yeah the earthen that got hit with the... Yeah, I'm absolutely correct in that. They're not supposed to be corruptible. If you go back to the original lore, the reason the Curse of Flesh was introduced in the first place was because the constructs could not be corrupted. And so, at least that's what the Titans would have us believe. Because the Titans built these constructs so that those things would not fall to corruption so this thing suggests that actually that's another lie by the titans and that their constructs can absolutely be corrupted um maybe it takes a little bit longer but the con the constructs are absolutely not incorruptible but one cool thing about this dungeon is that it's actually part of the main campaign as you play through isle of dorne now, I know some people mm -hmm. are instantly saying, wait a minute, I don't like doing dungeons. I just like solo questing. That's terrible. Well, fortunately, in 1025, towards the end of Dragonflight, we introduced this feature called Follower Dungeons. Yep. And we're really happy to bring that to the level up dungeons in War Within right from the outset so that you like can go it. in solo like with it. NPC allies as you play through the dungeon if that's what you prefer. Or of course you can just queue up with regular with, with friends or random group mates through the group finder. But what this lets us do is where appropriate, we can really have the story flow directly through dungeons in a way that 
we couldn't in the past in ways that at times was frankly awkward because sometimes mm -hmm. major villains die in dungeons. Dungeons are places of great importance in a zone, but we couldn't really tie them directly into the questing because we didn't want to create an obstacle for players who really just prefer to keep playing. Dude, such a mega win. This is why follower dungeons is such a good thing because you no longer have to end storylines in some, some sort of weird abrupt way just so that you can do the dungeon, but the dungeon needs to be separate from the weird abrupt way. And this also means that sometimes you get these really cool enemies in quest lines that you kill just in the quest line, and it it looks like this really epic monster, but it's a pushover because it's a solo thing, right? It's a thing that you should be able to do on your own. Whereas now they can really keep all of the cool epic things for the dungeon because you can just do the dungeon in follower mode you don't have to worry about finding a group and wasting your time sort of finding that group. Love it. Plus, hopefully, eventually we will get story dungeons that differ a little bit from max level dungeons or Mythic Plus dungeons insofar as the story version of the dungeon has a lot more actual story, right? So it is a cinematic experience it's an experience that is absolutely catered towards telling a story that the player follows through on rather than you know oh and once you get to the mythic version of it most of that shit goes away and you just have the cool dungeon without all of the cutscenes and all of the like mini shit you, you guys know what i'm talking about right almost every dungeon have these weird moments that you're just standing around there watching the timer go down and like dude can we just hurry this up i i, I don't know why like, this is bullshit. Uh, let's get the RP, the RP stuff out of the way so that we can actually do the dungeon. Hopefully we get a lot more RP stuff in the story versions now that you do have those two completely different uh, versions of the game, so to speak. Thanks, Solo. Tina, is there anything that you like? One of my favorites is in Hollow Fall. So it's called the Priory of the Sacred Flame. And it's this Aerithor yeah, monastery. Much every so uh, one of the coolest parts is the final boss room. There's this giant uh, window that frames the crystal that is embedded in the wow, ceiling of Hollow cool. Fall. And so I love, you know, the beauty of the room, as well as just how it ties in with the narrative of the story as a whole. And another really cool one, it's the City of Threads. So this one is underneath the Nerubian city proper. And so it's really uh, interesting to see the ancient civilization that the newer civilization was built on top of. And just to think about the layers of Nerubian history that, you know, is in wow. this land. Is it that the, the ancient civilization back in like Lich King? Even Far before oh, that, it's even, even farther before that. Yeah, the Nerubians, I think, you know, we might think of them as monstrous or arachnid. They are one of the great powers, one of the great advanced civilizations of Azeroth, right? Up. I, I made a new video. Uh, you'll, you guys will probably see it within the next few days or so. But I made a video in which I basically expressed uh, a lot of doubt. Because remember, the Titans claimed that they were the first, right? Um, that they were the ones who created pretty much everything and that everything sort of stemmed from them. But there's there's actual beings in Azeroth civilizations like the Klaxi, as well as the Nerubians, that predate the, the, the Titan arrival on Azeroth by a long time. Because remember, we don't actually know how many years was between the start of Azeroth and the actual Titan arrival. We don't know how many years that was. It could have been thousands, could have been tens of thousands, could have been hundreds of thousands of years. Man, it could be millions of years, right? That Azeroth existed long before the Titans finally arrived on Azeroth. Because time, history for us, really only starts once the Titans arrive, because before that, we don't really have many texts that, that speak about the time that came before it. And anything we would have from the time before the Titans arrived would be from the Void. And since you can never trust anything the Void says, it's incredibly difficult, right, to figure out how old Azeroth is. But we know that the Nerubians and the Kluxi predate at least the Titan arrival by X amount of years. And the Nerubians was an actual civilization when the Titans arrived already. Like, they were already an established civilization. So... 
the lore that we're going to uncover from the Nerubians. And also remember that the, these Nerubians aren't the ones that were killed and basically enslaved by Arthas. These Nerubians are untouched. They still uphold their ancient civilization, their ancient culture. So we're going to get to see what life was like on Azeroth before the Titans even arrived, before order. We're going to learn about the old gods and the ways of the old gods. Ah, oh, man, I am so ready for this. There with wow. the you know, elves and trolls and the others that helped shape the course of, of the world's history, we've only really seen hints of them. Going back to, to Wrath, if you ran the Asjol Nerub or Ankehet dungeons, you could see you know, their buildings off in the, in the background. But you know, they were a civilization that at its height rivaled the High Elves and the Nightborn on the surface. That's insane. They were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lich King's armies and win until the Old Gods and you know, their forces on another flank eventually led to the Nerubians being overwhelmed. But really being able to explore what they're all about oh, is one of the things we're most excited about when it comes You don't expect Nerubians to be cash shop uh, or shop owners. <laughs> Just vendors, just a bug standing around being a vendor, selling scrolls and all sorts of doodads. It's <laughs> to war within. One of the things we're excited to uh, bring is an arachnophobia filter, if you will. For all of you out there who uh, could never, you know, go to that spider section in Nax, uh, you'll be able to turn on our arachnophobia filter and all uh, spider beasts will turn into crabs. So very pumped about that. <laughs> yeah, it actually looks, it, yeah. it, it works way better than you might think just hearing okay. that sentence. I can't wait for players to you know, be able to jump in, turn it on and hopefully feel more comfortable in parts of our world you know this is massey i mean personally i don't exactly know how because i have arachnophobia i am scared of spiders but not in video games the video games doesn't matter or doesn't matter to me because it's not real it's only if it's in the room with me that it will freak me out but i'm sure there are people that have in like extreme arachnophobia and in that sense, saying, oh, you know, um, just weak. It's like, dude, you, you don't control what you have a phobia of. And of course, you can seek help and there are ways of getting you over that phobia. But if you have it and you would like to play a game, it's kind of nice that the developers are going, we'll take care of this for you so you don't have to worry about this shit as much. Right? I don't view that as, as a bad move. I think it's a good move because, again, if you're World of Warcraft, you want as many people to play the game as is humanly possible. And this would obviously get people to not want to play it, right? So, yeah, I <clears throat> personally, I think this is a good move. Will I use it? No, because spiders don't really bother me in the game. But there are some people that it does bother. right? And so it's a good thing that they're adding this for them. So something that when we announced the nerubian centric themes of war within at blizzcon we heard trepidation from portions of our community who love wow but were worried they weren't going to be able to experience it honestly prior to that it's something we heard okay king julian i'm genuinely not sure if you're trolling or just stupid is this is this a lack of intelligence speaking or is this trolling how is a, toggle to, uh, a toggleable option ruining the game for anyone? Y you go into the options, you toggle, and then you don't see spiders. Literally everyone else still sees spiders. Just you don't see spiders. H how is this option changing everyone else's game? Like, for anyone. <laughs> I, don't, I genuinely don't understand that logic, but all right. Concerns about from within our own team, where there are, you know, people who genuinely felt uncomfortable with these elements of the game that we were building together. And so we set out to try to find a solution that would still, you know, preserve the fidelity of the game, but really make it more approachable, more accessible to everyone. So speaking of the Nerubians, once we reach level 80, we're going to go to the new raid, Nerubo Palace. Uh, is there anything you want to speak about that? Yeah, this raid is epic in so many ways. Uh, one of the... Did she call it Nurgle Palace? 
surely not. Like, what? Once we reach level 80, we're going to go to the new raid, Nurbo Palace. Uh, oh. Is there anything you want to speak about Never that? I thought yeah, you this said raid Nurgle is Palace. epic in so many ways. I was like, what? Uh, one of the coolest parts is there's this beautiful uh, showpiece uh, that is just wow. in front of the Queen's Palace. It represents the Nerubian race and it just shows how highly Queen Ansrek thinks of her people and herself. <laughs> this raid will get one of the sections of the raid will get to wow. check out her innermost sanctum. This is where, you know, only uh, VIPs for the Nerubians get to go and you really get to explore explore the dark elegance of her palace. And again, as we were just saying, like the Nerubians, we need to remember they are an advanced race, very, you know, just this epic civilization. I think there's some parallels probably to going back to the Nightborn in Suramar and what going into that city and that palace felt like. We really want to show the sophistication here. It's, this is not a monstrous supervillain lair. This is, you know, a, a superpower of Azeroth that yep. we find ourselves, you know, facing off against. But yeah, the, the Queen Anserek encounter that Tina mentioned, she's going to be the end boss of sort of the initial season, the initial raid tier. Uh, the encounter team is hard at work on this one. I can't wait to see it tested later on in beta. Um, this is, you know, the, the whole room is really purpose built to showcase some vertical elements. And, you know, just it's just an incredible set piece. But we want to, as always, integrate the environment wherever possible into our encounters. So you're facing off against both, you know, a very powerful magic. Rustic J. I I accept what you're saying, but I reject the premise for one reason and one reason only. This is a video game. It is not the job of the Blizzard developers to help you deal with your phobias. Their job is to simply make the game as accessible and playable for as many people as humanly possible. That's it. Because they want to make money. If you have a problem with your phobia and you want to fix your phobia, then Go to a psychiatrist. Go get that shit sorted. That's why they exist. That's their job. It's not Blizzard's job to help you fix phobias and help you fix problems. Their job is just to make a game. And if their game have players that really hate spiders, then, you know, taking that shit away for people is fine. ...user, but also someone who is arachnid in nature. Mm -hmm. And how do we kind of deliver parts of the fantasy of, you know, scaling a web while locked in combat against the queen. Those are the things that we're currently exploring. Can't wait to see that up for testing. Does that mean we're going to get tier sets again? Certainly. I think <laughs> well, last time we tried taking them away, I recall <laughs> torches and pitchforks in the street. New tier <laughs> means new tier sets. And these days, you know, unlike years and years ago when you only had, when you had to raid in order to get the tier set, now you can get them from a wide array of activities, whether you're a raider, mythic plus player, or an outdoor world player, which includes now delves. Ah, Delves. Delves let's get, let's start talking about Delves. Yeah, I mean, Delves are one of the major new features in War Within, oh. and I think we're really excited to offer a, a more structured, progression-oriented extension of the outdoor world gameplay that we know is the favorite of so many of our players. And you know, Delves are these seamless experiences integrated into all of our zones where you yeah. can have these localized, varied adventures alongside in the first season, Brand Bronzebeard, either on your own or with friends. Um, and finally, you know, get a shot at some endgame epic rewards just through an extension of the outdoor world ecosystem. Yeah, we'll be able to get it from the Great Vault, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super exciting. So one of our goals with building Delves was we really wanted the player to just feel like they adventured, came across a place and could just, you know, go in and see what's inside. When you walk up to the Delve, there's this, you know, dark misty door and you click on it and then it just disappears and you just walk into your own personal Delve instance. So very exciting. In before this does not work day one. They... <laughs> I, I, can, I can already see it. The game goes live and the doors don't open or the door open and then closes again and it bugs out. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. But with newer technology, it's almost always going to create some level of issue. Excited about that. I mean, players are going to see how that first experience on the Isle of Dorne early in the alpha. Uh, the first delve they're likely to encounter is Earthcrawl Mines. You're going to encounter your good friend Bran Bronzebeard outside an ancient earthen mine that has been overrun with Nerubians who are borrowing up from the depths. Bran will ask you if you want him to outfit himself as a, as a healer or as a damage dealer to help support you. 
and you'll venture in and have your very first Delve experience. Um, you'll be able to choose whether you want to do it on Tier 1 or Tier 2 difficulty. Tier 1 is kind of the default. This is for everyone experience. Tier 2 is for those who want to opt into a bit more of a challenge because that's what they enjoy. Uh, there will be uh, higher like tiers this. that can be unlocked oh. at max level as part of the end game and seasonal progression. Nice. We really just can't wait to get player feedback from the outset, Here maybe we all go. through alpha on this new system, on you know how it is or isn't working for you, and whether we can you know, really meet everyone's expectations from people who just want a casual romp as an extension of their outdoor world experience to those who want a solo progression challenge that they can really strive to overcome. Um, feedback is gonna really help shape how this evolves, but we're so excited about Delves as a central part of War Within. Yeah, I'm excited that we're gonna be able to just jump in and get our, like go solo with Bran, or you can have friends, but also just get rewards in that way, especially the tier sets with the catalyst. Exactly. And then that really cool mechanical mount. <laughs> yeah, so this is gonna kind of be an introduction to the, sort of the Delve's end game. As you hit max level, as you hit 80, and start to get a sense of the Delve's ecosystem, right at the start of that, we're gonna give you this epic customizable mount, kind of the, the successor to the oh, customizable wow. drakes you had in Dragon Isles. Oh, We'll be able to, through doing Delve, earn a variety of different customizations and attachments that you can mix and match to really create your own personalized flying mount. <laughs> so does this mechanical mount have dynamic flying? This is one of the big questions we had moving on from Dragonflight. We had the question of like, well, okay, dragon riding is amazing. Mm -hmm. We're in, we can't get rid of this, mm -mm. but how is this gonna work alongside of the hundreds of mounts that we already have in players' collections? And how, from a design perspective, how do we navigate a world where some mounts can fly in this awesome way and others can only do the old quote unquote static flight? Uh, fortunately, I think our art team was able to work out an amazing solution for us. Yeah, we were very excited to be able to make pretty much all mounts be able to dynamically fly. So even Nimrod's head, Ian, we figured it out. <laughs> we made it work. So I'm really excited to see Nimrod's oh, okay. head going like super fast. <laughs> <laughs> Another feature coming in the War Within that I'm really excited about, as well as a lot of other people, is Warbands. Yeah, Warbands, I mean, uh, again, I think as I summarized it at BlizzCon, it's just account-wide everything, mm -hmm. almost everything. Uh, it, this, you know, players increasingly play multiple characters. And this is something we've heard loud and clear that mm -hmm. you know the game needs to be more alt friendly. That players want to be able to choose where they spend their time across their different characters instead of something like they have to reprogress everything individually. And so yeah the yep. warband is just It's funny that we've been saying this for about six, almost seven years. I remember this conversation being a heavy conversation during Legion already. During Legion, I remember making videos saying, bro, this is bullshit. If I level my alt, I don't want to keep doing the reputations. This is nonsense, right? Uh, because reputations aren't fun. So it's, it's nice that after seven years, Blizzard is finally realizing, hey, your game is designed in such a way for alts to be played. Alts should not be a punishment. It shouldn't feel like I'm being punished when I want to play on my alt. It should just be a natural extension of my account. I've already done this. I don't need to do it again. Just, it is your account in its entirety. It is your collection yes, of champions. Sir. Whether they're Horde or Alliance, regardless of what realm they're on, they're all part of the same warband, which gives access oh, to various nice. shared progression systems. And then you get to see all of your favorites on uh, you know, one screen together. So uh, in our new UI, we'll have warbands, and you'll be able to be like, you know, move four up into that space and see them all hanging out around a campfire. Is that on the character select screen? Yeah, the character select oh, screen. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's going to be totally different than what we're used to logging in. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. You'll, you'll know, like, this is a completely different world. It's a completely different welcome into World of Warcraft. Um, what we showed off at BlizzCon was just actually a UI mock-up but we're excited to see people react to the real thing. And really, as with everything else, you know, Warbands are a foundation. They're, this is a system that we want to build the next generations of World of Warcraft on. You know, in 2004, WoW launched with everything character-based. In 2024, WoW is going to shift to everything being account-based. And we can't wait to hear feedback about what other areas we can expand okay. upon here. And that's going to shape not just War Within, but later updates and expansions. And we're just, you know, just excited about this platform that better reflects the way our players are looking to play World of Warcraft today. Would it be interesting if changing character was a completely seamless experience? If it was possible to do. Do you think that would be an interesting move? 
So you don't even have to log out of the game. You literally run into your little space and just pick another one of your alts and then immediately run out of that space with your alt, right? And as soon as you exit the door, your alt goes to where they were lost. Imagine, like, just imagine this was possible from a technical standpoint. Would that be something that people would be interested in? Or does that sound more like a... You kind of still want to feel like you are playing a different class and a different character, and this would kind of take that away. So you wouldn't feel like you're playing a different character. You would just it would maybe muddy the waters a little bit. Cost money to play as my. Uh, what do you mean not cost money? Kind of like player housing, but obviously in this one we have this little camp thing, right? This little camp space that that is there. I'm just saying you run into that camp uh, camp area and you just go, right, now I'm going to play my paladin and you immediately shift to your paladin and now you just run out and your paladin is out in the world where they were before and you can just play on your, on your paladin and maybe you have like, a, you know, like you have your hearthstone. You have a similar item like this that if you're out in the world and you quickly want to log over to your alt, you literally just hit that button, go to your little campsite, pick a new character, go out back into the world and go do stuff on this alt, right, that maybe you want to do. I'm just sort of thinking it would be cool. I don't think it serves a purpose. I just think it would be a cool thing to do. You can't forget about PvP. Let's talk about it. Yeah, uh, so we have a new battleground called the Deep Hall. This one is earthen themed. It's a bit of a mashup between uh, Silver Shard Mines and Arathi Basin. So, you know, hold some points, push some carts. Uh, we're really excited to see how players uh, navigate around this one. Yeah, and in terms of how players are interacting with it, um, there is an overhaul to our rated battleground system that is coming with War Within. Uh, people who've been paying attention over the course of Dragonflight have checked out our uh, Battleground Blitz, our kind of brawl that was testing out a 8v8 solo queue rated Battleground format. We're happy to move to that as a default for how rated Battlegrounds are going to work going forward. I think we're really excited oh. to make that Battleground experience that personally I've always felt is the best part of WoW PvP, the larger scale, more cooperative, objective-based, um, you know, collaborative, and competitive setting, as opposed to the deathmatch style in Arena, so, to make that more accessible to everyone who, you know, loves Battlegrounds, loves PvP. Um, we know, you know, it's a bit overdue, honestly, us mm -hmm. adding... Yeah, well, I think, I think one of the things that sucked about rated Battlegrounds that almost always meant that most people would not partake in it is the fact that you needed a pre-made group in order to go into rated Battlegrounds. And since most people don't necessarily know that many people to do a battleground with, right? Uh, that kind of stopped people. Whereas this probably opens the door for a lot of people that would love to do more battlegrounds, but they don't want to form a group beforehand. You now just hit a button, load into your favor, you know, into the battleground, and this is a rated battleground where you gain ranks and you, you actually compete. Uh, against people of similar skill and similar level. So I do think, I think this is a bigger W than what most of us can imagine because I'm not a PvPer. So for me, this is just, I can see theoretically why this is cool. But of course, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not the one playing it. So if there's any PvP people in here, how do you guys feel about this change? Is this something you like or nah? Adding matter. a new Battleground map into the rotation. And we're excited to do more of this going forward. We're excited to have a new framework that can make Battlegrounds more central to the end game rewarding part of PvP. And mm -hmm. yeah, this is just you know, the beginning of a new chapter. Another feature in the War Within is Hero Talents. We've been having a lot of articles talking about them. What are some of the other things that we can expect with the Hero Talents coming forward? Well, I can say there's gonna be no more blogs and articles releasing hero talents because they'll be there for you to jump in and play. And I think that's, you know, the, mo the most exciting thing. We're so grateful to the community for all of the feedback and discussion in recent months, going back to the first blog in December. This really helped us shape this central feature of how people's class gameplay is going to evolve. Um, you're going to see hero talents that you haven't yet seen for the trees that we haven't discussed previously. And for many of the ones that we have released, you'll log in and see changes that are directly shaped by your feedback. 
uh, by what we heard loud and clear in some cases about what was and wasn't exciting. Um, we, we've committed to have as many of these playable right from the actually. outset as possible. We will have 100% of the hero talent trees available and playable not long into alpha. And then the rest of the journey is going to be about iteration, tuning, and really just dialing it all in to make the polished experience that everyone Frost is excited about. Back. So what are we doing with professions in The War Within? Uh, I think when we, we really overhaul professions in Dragonflight, we saw that as, as a kind of a permanent shift in how professions were going to work going forward. So you can expect you know, new recipes, different enchants, but the same fundamental sort of progression and structure to professions that you saw in Dragonflight. One big piece of feedback that we heard throughout Dragonflight, though, was a bit of frustration with the work order system from crafters who were just looking to complete quests, looking to skill up, but found themselves competing and often racing to grab work orders with their fellow crafters. Um, so what we're excited to offer is a baseline availability of basically NPC crafting orders. Uh, so it could be you know Earthen in Isle of Dorn who need a hammer made or need a helmet made, and they're constantly putting their offer, their work orders up onto the, onto the market so that there's always something for you to grab. The it's player ones bad. will still be more lucrative. And yes, Massey, you are absolutely correct. When you have to complete a work order in order to get some of the profession XP so that you can level your, your profession, and then uh, there's no work order for you to make. And it's like, bro, what how am I supposed to level this? I don't have a work order to make here. The one problem that I have with the profession system in Dragonflight is just, it is so convoluted from a leveling perspective. It feels so terrible to level because I love the fact that it's, it's immersive as shit, right? You have to learn all of these different things and every single thing does its own thing. But it, it, it also at the same time, Dragonflight is the first expansion where I didn't do professions on any of my alts. I was just like, I could not be asked. There's no shot that I'm doing all of this crap on another character. Zero chance. I, I don't even want to level another character just thinking about the fact that I have to do professions on this character. At least with the old professions, they were boring as shit, but easy to level. I kind of feel like they should make it a little bit easier to level. Uh, just, just even if it just grants more ways of leveling, like more ways of getting the XP or the points required to level up would already be pretty good rather than the sort of, you get a couple of uh, world quests that will give you some profession knowledge, but then the rest of it is like a weekly thing that you'd get. So there's like a set amount that you can level. It It would be better if it's, so here's the thing that could change. Just one change that could actually make it a hell of a lot better. You know how you have that first craft? Every single time you craft something for the first time, it actually gives you one knowledge that you can then use to level up. Well, what if you did that? Say your first craft gives you one knowledge. After that, every fifth craft gives you one knowledge. And then, say, for example, once you've received 10 knowledge off of that, every 50th craft will give you one knowledge. So there's at least some way, especially for some of the stuff that you make consistently, uh, still guarantees you some of that knowledge, rather than just, you know, there's periods of time where you have nothing to craft because there's literally nothing that's going to give you knowledge but there should always be that baseline availability if you just want to skill up, you just want to practice your trade skill. And there's also some cool potential for narrative tie-ins, the ability to have quests that now can point you towards that system because we can count on it always being there. So with Dragonflight and the profession overhaul, there was also a UI overhaul. Is there anything we're going to see with The War Within? Yeah, so the UI overhaul, it's basically a continued improvements that we want to make over time. One of the things that I'm very excited about is the uh, quest bang over, uh, overhaul. So we're going to have a bunch of new icons that will make uh, what type of quest it is much more clear. One of the new ones that you'll see is one that's like we consider an important one. These aren't campaign, but they're pretty important to your character. For instance, some uh, that must do ones for your profession, it's already kind or of ones where you're going to unlock the revival catalyst. Yeah, I think as we've leaned more and more into outdoor world gameplay and varied gameplay there, different types of public events over the course of Dragonflight, 
Honestly, we reached a point about halfway through Dragonflight where we just took a look at our map and kind of recoiled in horror at the number of different icons that were there. And it was just a kind of icon soup situation that made us say, like, it's kind of at this point, we've advanced far past the world of, oh, you just have some daily quests or world quests here. Yeah, we need a clearer quests. visual language. And so really excited to just... I remember a time where blue quests were either daily or weekly. You just had to go and then it would say whether this is a weekly or a daily quest. And there were only really two types of markers. It was the yellow exclamation point or the pub, uh, the blue one. That uh, was it. <laughs> just evolve that central interface that players use to log in and see what there is to do in WoW on a given day. Mm -hmm. So that covers the War Within, and the alpha is starting extremely soon. Pretty much working on getting it stood up <laughs> as we speak, as we sit here right now. And yeah, so the way this is going to work is pretty similar to the Dragonflight Alpha for those who, who followed that, where really each week, each new build that we release, we're focusing on a different piece of War Within to concentrate player feedback and our attention to just really get all that feedback in and maximize the quality. So we're going to start off zone by zone, level band by level band. This first week is going to be the Isle of Dorne, level 70 to 73 or so, the dungeon and delves there, as well as universal systems like Hero Talents. With successive alpha builds, we'll move on to other zones, other portions of War Within, um, inviting more waves of people. If you haven't gone to the website to opt in yet, that's a great reminder <laughs> to do so. Um, we, you know, really pick from. Really, true, there's no secret to it. We're just randomly pulling lots of folks in and hope to get by the end of this countless people into our testing. Um, once we've gotten through all of those rounds of focus testing, we'll move into our beta phase which really is an end-to-end -end holistic test of War Within from 70 all the way to 80 and the end game and beyond. And throughout, you know, feedback, bug reports, suggestions, all of this is instrumental mm -hmm. to helping turn what we have now into the finished product that we want to be the best it possibly can be for all of our players later this year. Thank you so much for joining me for the War Within. And thank you for joining us for this. Really, this is one of the most exciting times ever for the development team, when we get to pull back the curtain and welcome you all into this world that we've been building in the last few years. So can't wait to see you in the alpha and can't wait to hear all of your feedback. Really looking forward to everyone checking out what we built. Thank you so much. I, I wish, I know we're all excited for the alpha because it's finally something new. Mothy Pants, how you doing, bro? But I so wish there wasn't a PTR for it or at the very least, the people that you do invite into it aren't allowed to speak about it. They're not allowed to make videos. They're not allowed to leak anything. So you only really invite a, a small handful of people to taste some stuff for you. And they just go. Or hopefully, we're not going to get that. I was hoping maybe they leave some stories out. Maybe they don't do the questing experience. And, and you basically just go through the world and you can see the world and taste the, the systems. But you don't taste the story. Because all this means basically is, you know, we're going to get, by the time Dragon, by the time the War Within launches, the story will already be known, right? I would have already made videos about speculations of what the story is going to be. Every YouTuber out there would have already told you exactly what goes on in the story and how it goes into the story and what you can expect from the story. So basically the whole story is spoiled before it even goes live, which is kind of sad. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, what's the point of a story if it's spoiled before it's even finished? Because you don't get the full experience in beta. You, you don't get the cinematics. You don't get all of the voice acting. Most of the quests are sometimes broken. But you do get the whole story, right? You do get it. So you don't really, you miss out on that fundamental core experience of what it was. But then again, you know, is what it is. This has always been Blizzard's thing, so I guess we'll just go with it for now at least. Overall, though, I have to say 9 out of 10 for everything announced. I'm super excited to see how all of this plays out and what we get to see. So what do you guys think? 